from the Fatheads Eyewear Studio in Indianapolis, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Maybe I need to start in the trash truck business. <laughs> Don't rule it out. But the steering is folks on the wheel straight ahead. The steering's broken. Bridges takes the wheel and he goes, whoa, whoa. whoa. He's airborne and then I'm above him. And uh, all at the same time. Yeah, you're just like, wow, that's a wild picture. <laughs> he gets behind the race car and he tells me if I'm good or not. And if I'm good, he'll go, perfect. <laughs> I hang up on the guy. I go, who's this? This is Deion Sanders. I go, yeah, nice try. See you later. Bounce and then this insane roll. That thing sent it. I, I hate qualifying. It's the worst. It's literally the worst thing you could ever do. But I'm smooth and creamy like milk chocolate. <laughs> Have you ever not saw a Hershey bar that did not look good? Hi, I'm Tony Stewart. I'm Mario Andretti. I'm Johnny Rutherford. I'm Angel Sampe. I'm Travis Pastrana. This is Antra Brown. Hi, I'm Nita Sittestrom, and this is The Skinny. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to The Skinny. We're here in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm Ken Stout. Rico Elmore has joined me sitting in the middle seat. As always, Mr. Michael Young, the track dude, Back. right on the controls. What's happening? And sitting on the set with us is a lovely lady. She is a 2023 FIA European Top Fuel champ. Yep. Congratulations, Miss Ida Zetterstrom. Thank you so much. Thanks for having did me. Did I say it right? Yeah, you did. Close enough? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I didn't say it as fast as you said it in, at the top of the show. Yeah, so. I, I speak quite quick, and it's even worse when I speak in Swedish. <laughs> well, yeah, you're in a business of quick, so it's probably a good thing. <laughs> True. Thanks for taking the time. Come in here and uh, welcome to the States. How long have you been here? So I've actually been here since February. So I moved over here to Indy uh, in February. And um, yeah, I've been back and forth to Europe a few times since then, but most of the time here in the U.S. So let's fill the fans in. You were born in Sweden, but moved or grew up in a small island. Is it called a land? So it's in Sweden, it's Åland. In uh, English, it's Åland Islands. So uh, I was born in Sweden, lived there until I was 12, moved over to this small island in between Sweden and Finland. Uh, it's a Finnish island, but we actually speak Swedish. So I'm half Swedish, half Finnish, but I don't speak any Finnish. So. <laughs> what took you guys there? My mom is from there. So yeah. I have most of my family is living there and I've grown up there all summers, basically. So even though when we lived in Sweden, all of our summers, when we were not at the racetrack, we were at my uh, grandmother's cabin on all the islands and all the Christmas have been spent there and so on. So you're on this small island of 30,000 people. How in the world do you end up in the racing industry? So I ended up in the racing industry long before we moved there. Basically, I've been at the track since I was three weeks old. Uh, my, my parents have been involved in racing and never raced the same classes as I have, but definitely been at the racetrack. My, my dad has built engines and worked with teams. So uh, since I was three weeks old, I was there. When I was eight, I started racing junior dragsters. So that was way before we moved away to this island. So when we were there... Getting to go racing definitely were a little, took a little more time, so to say, every time. Because you had to leave your island and go to Sweden or to Finland or to Norway. But I was already in that circus, so to say, and there was no taking me out of it. So, yeah. That could have been like what you were talking about off the uh, camera where they handed you the baby at the track. That could have been you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, could have been you in the middle yeah, of that, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I I think I've seen a lot of pictures of myself when I was a kid laying somewhere with my you know ear mufflers on sleeping. So I, I have an easy time sleeping at the racetrack, no matter how much noise is on. I think that's where it comes from. You know? I got to tell you, I think that's the first time ever in my life I've heard them called ear mufflers. I love that. I thought the same thing. By the way. <laughs> I'm like, you know, Julie, Julie, was... Julie, do you call them mufflers? <laughs> we always we always say ear muffs, and I'm like. Has that been an abbreviation my entire life for yes, mufflers? Yes, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's awesome. <laughs> Julie says things at time. I'm like, hold on, say that one yeah, more I'm time. Let me hear what you, what you, what you said there again. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. I've been a little bullied over certain things I pronounce different ways and so on coming over here. But yeah, I think that's just things we have to take. You know? <laughs> so uh, what were the biggest challenges of making the trip? to the states well i mean obviously a lot of it has to do with you know visas and permits coming over a lot of you know lawyers back and forth and filling out forms and feeling like you spend a lot of time on that uh so so that was probably the 
the thing that took the most time to get over. I mean, the the moment I knew I was coming over here, the day after I had sold half of my furniture on online and like trying to get someone to rent out their apartment, and, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. So that felt fairly easy because it's something I've been working towards for so long. So it was nothing really holding me back once we know we can do it. But obviously there's a lot of other steps you have to take when you're moving over when you're not American to come in here. So that was, of course, a big part of it and finding an apartment, knowing, you know, all the small stuff coming over here, like, hey, I, I've lived by myself for many years, but all of a sudden I don't know where to go to buy my groceries or, you know, small stuff like that. So it kind of felt like you're 17 again, moving from home and trying to find your way. So, yeah, still working on that one. <laughs> Are you driving this weekend? We both said, no, Tony's driving. You're driving this weekend. No, Tony's driving. <laughs> and now it's just like great. a standard answer. The Skinny is brought to you by Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. And American Coach, innovation is our life force. There's the lovely Miss Julie Nada. She's hanging out over there in the corner. Always good to have her with us, and she is directly responsible for bringing Ida to the show here today. Welcome back to the Skinny Ladies and Gentlemen. Great to have you with us here in the Fatheads Eyewear Studio. We're talking to Miss Ida Zetterstrom, uh, who runs in Top Fuel now, new to the States, uh, asking some of the questions and about some of the challenges to get over here. We want to touch base on her career. Well, you know, she started off very young, as she just documented in the first uh, segment. You will be uh, um, interested in knowing she's also extremely efficient on board a drag bike. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first, my good friend, Mr. Michael Young, has a question as well. Well, I just was thinking, you were talking about coming over to the States, and I always find it fascinating working with the drivers in IndyCar when they first get to the States. What was the biggest culture shock or one of the things that when you experienced it for the first time, you, you had no idea what it was? And, and what is your favorite cultural thing in the United States so far? Uh, oh, that that's a good question. I feel like I'm still finding things that are new to me uh, or just small things of like how we communicate different on things. But then it can also be, I love how patriotic you guys are over here with, you know, singing the anthem before the race day and so on. That's not something that we particularly always did in Europe when I grew up. So definitely the first couple of times I came to the track over here, and it was a Sunday, and Sunday usually means you've been at the track for a few days, your hair is all messed up, and you throw a cap on, and then someone says, remove your headgear. And I'm like, oh my God, like I, I didn't even think that I should have, <laughs> should have done my hair today. So yeah, first time I did it also, I had a camera in my face, and I, I used, yeah. So that was a, that was oh, a new thing. Oh, that's so good. Now I know that like on race day on Sunday, you got to calm your, you gotta, yeah, your hair. Calm your hair, like, <laughs> Don't just put a cap on because obviously we need to sing the, the anthem. Like, and, and that is very, I like that. And obviously my car right now with the new livery, I have the American flag all over it. And it's definitely paying tribute to me coming over here, living my American dream. So it, all of that is a big part of it. But there's still a lot of new things that, that I'm learning coming over here. You saw that car. The car is beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I just saw on social media the rigs pulling out for Redding. But... You know, I think it's interesting. I've been, you know, we've all been around motorsports for a long time, but the NHRA have been around for many, many years myself. And and I think it's interesting, uh, you know, you got Zippy, you got John, you know, they were together and and both super talented guys. And then they split apart and it's almost like it's, lit a fire under both of them even more i think so too i i like the cars are running like yeah. really good yeah and i feel like obviously they're two really great tuners but seeing them working apart because obviously it goes in any real relationship so to say you don't always um have the same thought on how on how to do things but letting them run their own shows uh on two different cars and seeing what works according to to their thoughts and ideas i think that's something that's going to benefit this team a lot and i mean i see john getting to run this car as he wants to and seeing how how good we've been doing in such a short amount of time and, and also tony's car coming out running really strong i do feel like this is a this is a good thing they they're two really good tuners that we can can split up and i'm very happy to work with john i uh we have 
we've been able to build this team so quickly. Obviously, John has done all of that with hiring all the guys, building the cars and doing all that. But also, I've always had a really tight uh, relationship with my tuners, whether it was been racing bikes or racing top fuel in Europe and so on. And I think it's very important that you work well together to get the maximum out of both the car and the driver. And many of the times you do need to adapt either the car to the driver or the driver to the car. And that's when all that comes into play. And I think that it's felt very natural uh, when I came in and started working with John, who's very easy to work with and and uh, knows so much about these cars and every question I've had or thoughts about something, he's been so great at answering it to me so that I feel like uh, I've felt very comfortable getting into the car. He's confident from the start, which I feel like he has played such a big role in. So you, did, Michael, going back to Michael's culture shock question, did you happen to get to go to the state fair this year? I did not. Okay. We'll get him that way. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those uh, American traditions. Hey, I want to take a step backwards because you two guys are speaking fluently because yeah. you're around each other and you're in the sport all the time. But for the fans at home, you might not realize she drives for a team called JCM Racing. That is John and, unfortunately, his wife passed away, Kathy Menard. Joe. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Joe. 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 And Joe. And Ka- John Schaefer Joe is a crew chief. Yes. Joe and Kathy Maynard. Yeah. They started um, the team. So they're the yeah. ones behind the behind the team. And you said, Tony, we should let them know that you're speaking of Tony Schumacher, the eight-time champ. Um, what is it, 86 wins or something I think he has. So something like that. Um, yeah. 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 Pretty, yeah. pretty good uh, pretty good teammate to have. So when you're talking about the tuners and and you know, you building that chemistry with John Schaefer, your your crew chief, uh, I wanted them to understand what you were talking Absolutely. about. Because there's two yeah. Tonys in the sport now. That's very true. Yeah, two very good ones. Yeah, two really good ones. That's and, right. And that so. is also though funny because when I came over in the beginning, for some reason, since I also I also work with Dodge, and so does Leah, Tony's wife. Um, I had people when we sat on signings. So Leah obviously has been out of the seat this year with Tony driving, and I sat outside for. 12 races before I started driving and they asked me and Leah the same thing how does it feel or like are you driving this weekend we both said no Tony's driving are you driving this weekend no Tony's driving and now <laughs> it's just like great. a standard answer I'll stir up a little bit of controversy <laughs> moment <laughs> which Tony <laughs> how so, come both of you are referring to Tony yeah exactly yeah <laughs> we're gonna so. take a quick break right here we'll be back with more from Miss Ida Zetterstrom they said it's not going to wheelie. And when I have my helmet on, we're going to start. They say it shouldn't wheelie. <laughs> yeah. She's been 688 at 215 miles per hour on a motorcycle. Yeah. A super street bike at that, Miss Ida Zetterstrom. Did we say it right? Is it Ida? Oh, yeah. You want to go with Ida? I want to Because I've heard you pronounce it your own name. We heard a fan. <laughs> yeah. I heard you got, heard you got, set, you got straightened out. Yeah, I got, I got stopped by a, by a fan that let me know. He said, I, I'm sorry, I don't want to seem rude, but I think you're pronouncing your name wrong because my grandma's name was Ida, and it's spelled the same way. So, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank just here to help. Just here yeah. to help. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. gotta appreciate when they help. I need you help. around more often. Can you come around and help me with other stuff? So you won a Scandinavian uh, championship on the super street bikes, yeah. and they're equivalent to over here a pro bike with that. A, a pro street a, bike. A pro street bike. Yeah. And I was doing I haven't so I used to love drag bike racing. I actually on a as a much younger, thinner man, did it for a bit. And uh, and I was reading some of the stats on it, and it said 750 horsepower. I'm like, what? So I quick texted Eddie Krawick. I said, dude, is that right? 750 horsepower? He said, they make 750 to 800 pretty yeah. reliable or pretty reliable now. So uh, I horsepower. always said 750 because that's what we actually used on track. Because I mean, you can dyno your bike to more. You can just up the boost even more. We ran about 1.6, 1.7 bars of boost. Not sure what that's in PSI. I need to look that up. But and with that, we used about 750 horsepower uh, putting down on track. And this is no wheelie bar bikes, street tire bikes. And in Europe, we are limited to a 68 inch wheelbase. While over in US on the pro street bike class, they had some different rules, and you could have a little bit longer wheelbase. But the combination was was the same. Long swing arm bikes. 
So 68 inch in Europe is not, it's a longer swing arm than a yeah. street tie bike. Of but course, here but I think they're the, longer, right? Absolutely. They're over here they're longer. Okay, a lot, a lot of them is longer. And then of course you can get into grudge bike racing over here when you have the super, super long swing arms where it looks like they could do the burnout and stage at the same time. But yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> Eddie said to me, he says, yeah, Gage just went 641 on one. And like you said, yeah, I mean, the, the rules bike. might be a little yeah, bit different, yeah. but uh, he said, yeah, he just went 641 on his. And I said, well, riding that pro stock bike must be like driving a junior dragster to him. <laughs> he said, yeah, it's for a good bit easier to ride than one of those monsters. Yeah, and the thing, of course, the the pro stock bikes being a naturally aspirated big CC bike, you will have the really quick uh, 60 foots and like all that, that we don't get the same way when you're running a no bar bike, because obviously we, we don't want to flip that thing, but we are running the turbocharged bikes, or I know Gage ran the nitrous bike when he ran that. Um, so obviously there's different combinations, but you have a power adder and that's basically the different thing. And obviously when you run a naturally aspirated bike or car, usually the most of it happens in the start and sure. then the rest is not as exciting if you if you say it like that but the same thing that happens in a top fuel car is the same if you're running a, uh, a turbocharged bike for example it just never stops pulling like there's constantly more power coming in you could easily pull a wheelie right before the finish line when you're running the super street bike sure. so it's it's a different animal different power power monster basically <laughs> what what would give you any idea of why you would want to do that <laughs> Well, I mean, it's a fantastic feeling, though, and I think that that class is, is very cool because it's a good combination of the rider and the, the like the build of the bike. Like, you need to have a good bike. You need to have a, a good engine because, like, if, if you're – you can build an engine where you just put a lot of boost on it and then you, you rev it and you – you know throw the rods out out of it but that's not reliable like you need a you need a combination where you can be quick and you can be constant like you can you can run that consistently um but you also need a good tuner to you know to get all that max out of the bike but not go above the limit where you actually have to start you know basically pedaling the bike so to say like sure. uh, doing that and and it's a it's a great combination of having a good rider on it have a good tuner and a good engine builder and someone that sets up your bike and i i fell in love with that like you had to be really good in all these aspects and have a great teamwork to build that and we built a really good team and the bike is really fun to drive like it's it's constantly it shouldn't have the front wheel on the ground like this because you constantly just go like this like pulling small wheelies all the way down you should feel that the power is con consistently you know just getting uh getting worse so to say and usually like when you pull uh we pull the clutch in after the finish line you get an adrenaline rush where i, I haven't been able to find it anywhere else basically because it's like if you're in a car even if it gets a little sketchy you you know you're protected on a bike when it gets a little sketchy you pull the clutch and you feel like damn that was a close one so <laughs> it's <laughs> it's different it is. that's it's pretty wild yeah joey uh he got eight up on one of those, I think, right? Yeah, we so uh, when I went here in 18 and raced in Mine Cup, both Gage and, and Gladstone were in the same class. Like, we raced together, which I think is very fun now, awesome. seeing they both being in an Israel and, yeah. and I'm in Top Fields. Yeah. So, so I'm really curious at what age, when did you think to yourself, you know, it's drag bikes. I want to give a drag bike a try. And obviously you felt comfortable on it to escalate to the to the point that you're at i mean uh, and how did mom and dad feel about that i mean okay so you've been at the racetrack your whole life and like you said i mean i could see mom and dad saying oh yeah let's put her in a race car and see how things go she's protected yeah. but a drag bike's a whole another world that's a different animal yeah i mean i've actually drag bikes was never something that i grew up looking at honestly i mean i was probably one of those that when the drag bikes ran i got up the grandstands like no offense but that was me growing up like I love the cars like that was that was my thing and uh, after junior drag so I did super comp for a little bit or a license in super comp got to run a little bit and then I was out of it for for quite a bit I didn't have the money to buy my own race car or go go racing with my own funding um and then actually my, my boyfriend started racing bikes and when he was in it he started racing super street bike and I got I, I couldn't race yet i didn't have like anything to race but i got to fill in love with the class like i worked with him i did his clutch and we worked on the bikes together did all that and i kind of just saw like damn this is a really competitive class and on a really high level over in europe they are a pro class so they run the same way that pro stock bike is a pro class over here we ran together with the with the pro stock cars and the top fuels and all that 
and it was basically one of the highest classes you can run on the bike side. So starting to look at it, I wanted to give it a try because obviously it's honestly it's cheaper to race bikes than it is to race a Absolutely. car. Like not lying, it, it, it is. So I was like, this is something I might actually be able to pull off running on a really higher level in a really competitive class that was really healthy. We could easily have 38 bikes on a big European event in Europe and everybody was competitive and really good. So I saw that as like, hey, this is, one of the best racing you can get into right now in Europe. And yeah, it's on a bike. I'm I'm not, I'm very new to this. I've never done it before, but let's give it a shot. So like we, we built a bike and I, my first class I run in bikes was actually super street bike. Um, so yeah, in, in Europe, it's very different because over here, you have a lot more open track days. You have a lot more testing opportunities. We don't have that in Europe. So my first race on that bike was actually a European championship event with 30,000 people in the grandstands and you just sit there. And I remember, since I don't have any background racing bikes, I asked my team probably 20 times before we lined up. I said, it's not going to wheel me, right? And they said, no. And I was like, okay, that was the only thing I was concerned about. I said, it's not going to wheel And they said, it's not going to wheel And when I have my helmet on, we're going to start. They say, it shouldn't wheelie. <laughs> yeah. And I pulled a wheelie. Which that was, good. it was up on the point of, you know, I have a, a photo over. of me with the, you know, with the legs on the side, you know, like seeing over like this and, and you can see the full underneath of the bike. Got We're going to need that for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll send it over. But yeah, I, I got it down. Um, definitely not. I, I, I got it down, but not as, as well as I have gotten my other wheel stance down. Cause that year. They call me the wheelie queen in the press because we wheelie constantly everywhere all the time at any track. But the good thing about it was that I really got to learn how to control a good a wheelie because it it's a it's a, an art to control a good wheelie because you need to know it, like is is this a power wheelie that is coming in and it's gonna come back down again or is this a wheelie where it just wants to you know snap up you're in the band and it's just going to keep yeah exactly and also when you let it down you need to know like if you just let it down you're going to hurt some stuff you're going to hurt yourself like when you just let it down you need to be able to catch it at the right moment where you can catch it and keep going because if you if you don't do it right it's going to bounce and it's going to go up on another wheelie and you're going to lose the whole run or it's going to come down way too hard and that was the thing i learned that my first my first year i i really got to learn how to control a wheelie and honestly it did help me in the like in the rest of my career, when we really got a handle of that bike and we really, you know, got a bike that we could win championships with, we won, won rounds because I could save a wheelie um, that maybe others hadn't trained as much on that I had on, basically. <laughs> so it's pros and cons with everything, but it was definitely a, a fabulous first round there. <laughs> what happens if you puke in your helmet when you have your glove on and you're about to run? We have Miss Ida Zetterstrom on the set with us here. This is the Fatheads Eyewear Studio. You're watching the skinny. Uh, yeah, having a good time here. We always do. So uh, the first person, not the first female, the first person to run in the 70s, 370s in top fuel in Europe. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, and up until this season, we were actually the only one that have done it. Uh, so we did it in in 22 and then we ran in the 70s again in, in 23 um, and then this year we actually had one of our uh, old teammates did it too so yeah it's very cool and a really strong qualifying pass uh, i shouldn't say qualifying pass uh for your license licensing pass in, in the 380s yeah we're on an 86 uh, as a licensing pass and over in europe that was at the time i think the fourth or the fifth quickest time um right then and that was actually we had a mole belt come off a little bit before the finish lines we had a really low top speed but but a good et so it was a really good feeling getting into that car i have to say You've got to reenact a story here for us because we were, as usual, before the show this time, not during commercial break, uh, she told us a great story about uh, about doing your nails. Uh, you you have to... We have were your... commenting on Julie's nails. Yeah, you were. Right? Right. Julie said things. she didn't like the color of her nails. <laughs> so when she, you went on to tell a story about how you really need to get them done before you go racing now, and there's a reason. Yeah, well, basically... We... Me and Julie got into talking about like the reason to doing your nails. I mean, it's very nice when you have nicely done nails, but for me, it's always been because 
my nails are thin and they break. Like if you're at the racetrack, I constantly, you know, you pack your parachutes and you break them off and then you go and you do your nitro and then you get nitro in it. And all of a sudden you're sitting in the race car and you're thinking, why can I feel the pulse of my thumb? Because it's like you, you can just, it just hurts. <laughs> like So what? someone told me, uh, go and get your nails done. And I was like, for what? And they said, no, you like you strengthen them. They You don't make them longer. You just put something on them so that they're strong. It's been working like a charm for probably three years up until until my debut weekend uh, in Brainerd and I for some reason I hit my pinky in something and my like my natural nail snaps off like from from the beginning like down half of the nail comes off first it's you know it's blood everywhere it uh, hurts that I take a little electrical tape putting over it like to just I mean, keep that's it in like place. A duct tape duct you got to go with a duct but, I, but I'm an electric <laughs> I'm an electrician so I do electrical <laughs> tape <laughs> so, that's just it <laughs> yeah. so so basically it didn't fall off like half of the nail was still attached but half of it was was loose so I, I put tape on it but then when I went and did the nitro, I got nitro in it and it hurt so bad. I was like hurling on the back because I thought I was going to puke and, you know, sweat. Nothing like, and, like putting nitric acid <laughs> on a freshly opened wound. <laughs> it's like some nitrometan in there did not help. So I went to my, I went to my crew chief and I said, pull this off. Like I could not, I tried myself, but it hurt too bad. The when tape he, or the nail? The, the tape. But when he pulled the tape, I saw the nail like fly like that. <laughs> and it was like no nail, like nail gone. And yeah, it hurts so bad. Like you can see photos of me with fans and I have my nail out like this on the side or like my finger because I'm so like, like, oh, I'm she's so, she, she's so, <laughs> that's not etiquette. Yeah. <laughs> she's so European. Exactly. She never figure out but like it's this. like, I was so afraid to hit it in something. Yeah. And, and then the, the, the second thing came, you know, you put your gloves on and we have the under gloves, which you can put on quite easily, quite soft, but then you need to shove it into your other gloves so that it actually goes in the whole way. And first time when I tried to put my gloves on, I again felt, you know, sweat breaking out, starting to feel like I want to hurl, like it was like bad. So I was so afraid that like, what if I, you know, you put your helmet on, put your suit on, and the last thing you do is your gloves. What happens if, what, what happens if you puke in your helmet when you have your glove on and you're about to run? So I had two helmets in my back of my car because I was like, if the worst happens and I have to puke because of my pain, I can have a second helmet. Yeah, get the other bucket out. <laughs> get the other helmet. Yeah, it was a it was a strange thing, but no, I, I didn't cry at least, but broken nail, I understand what people say now when broken nail hurts, just like that was, the whole nail came off and that was not sweet. It hurts so bad. And there you have it. It's not easy being a girl and running a top fuel car. Exactly. Get your nails done. <laughs> We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Want to get the skinny on other guests in different types of motorsports? Check out our YouTube page and get the skinny. The skinny is brought to you by American Coach. American Coach, innovation is our life force. And Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. Welcome back to The Skinny. Great to have everybody here inside of the studio, with the exception of Miss Julie Natus, who just left us middle of the show. What's up with that? Look at I this. Don't know. Look we'll at this. Wrong. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> she, yeah, she's she's gone. Be later, I Julie. must have said something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so I was I I uh, checked out your social media, being the proper uh, host, doing their homework slash stalker, and. <laughs> I saw that you uh, threw the first pitch out of the Indians game. Oh, I did, yeah. How cool was that? How did that go? I mean, they said it was a strike, and I was like, I thought that was bobbling, but, I mean, whatever, they were happy. So, I have never... Did you say you thought it was what? I thought that was like in bowl bowling, when you go bowling, like strike. A strike? Oh, oh it is. It's oh, like it strike. is. Yeah. And I was like, never heard that before. It's... But, yeah, so, I'm new to baseball. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she said... I thought it was bally, like a ball instead of a strike. Yeah. Or, I was like, hold on a minute. What did you say again? <laughs> it's so good. But yeah, no, I had never been at a baseball game. And in my mind, we have something back at home that's called Brembon. And it's like, it's a ball game where you also run around like that when you, but the guy that, that pitches the ball, so to say, he stands in front of the guy that hits it and you throw it in the air and now they got hit it. So it's completely different. And in my mind, the ball was the same. So I got it. So he it. just tosses it up to him. Exactly. But but really? this ball was, I mean, our balls that we use for that are tennis balls. So when they threw me this one, I was like, throw it over here. And then I catched it. And I was like, ah, oh, like it's 
it's hard. Like that one doesn't bounce. It's like she's a top field driver. Just throw it at her. <laughs> just fling one at her. She'll get it. it. Yeah. Well, I learned a lot of new stuff, so it's good. The so first ever baseball game. That's and that's a cool. great. That's a great stadium. It's a great stadium. Yeah, it's I a great place. There. Yeah. I mean, if I wouldn't have been like invited to go there, I don't think I would have looked up baseball as the first thing to do in India. But after being there, I would definitely bring other people that comes to visit to, to that uh, stadium because I think it was really cool. Have you went to an NFL game yet? I am not. All right, we'll fix that. <laughs> yeah, I went to get you to a football game. I, yeah, I, I I've saw also that. I've never been to NASCAR or in the car or sprint car, so I have a lot of things to do. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Kind of fix all kind of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, we need That's to super easy. Yeah, the, Michael Young might know somebody in IndyCar. We'll fix it. We may or may not have just had the president of IndyCar on the show. So yeah. We, well, might we obviously to, don't have that in Europe. Like, we, we don't have NASCAR, yeah. IndyCar, or sprint car racing. So I've never yeah, Formula seen One. I mean, have you, have do, you been yeah. to an F1 race? I actually haven't been to an F1 race. I did work, though, uh, a year in uh, Porsche Spring Challenge. So yeah, I, I, I worked as a mechanic there for one year. But so that's what I've seen. But I haven't been to all the races that are over here. So. Plenty of things to look forward Plenty to. Plenty of things to So do. this may run over into the next segment. We don't want Michael get all upset, but. What's the transition from that bike to a fuel car? I have to say the transition was easier than I thought. Like for me, transitioning onto a bike from racing cars, it was really hard. And, you know, I was a struggling a lot to learn because they're, they're, it's hard. Like, but what was the path? How did you say, you know what, I've done this bike. I'm, I think I'm going to go run top fuel. Top fuel has always, like, it's always been the goal. That's been the like, goal. Yeah. So, okay. so I've always worked towards racing top fuel. And even, even when I raced the bikes, like we were... We said, we're going to give it three more years to win the championship in Scandinavia because that was a really tough championship. And we said, well, we won that. We want to give it three more years to run in Europe. And then I want to get my top fuel license. Like that is the next step. But after we won the championship in Scandinavia, uh, COVID hit. And all of a sudden, you know, your whole game plan got thrown out the window because one year went by and another year went by with nothing happening. Yeah. So all of a sudden, all of most of my big sponsors knew that my end goal was to get into top fuel. So I kind of called them up and said, like, hey, we need to get a game plan earlier than thought because, like, nothing is happening in Europe right now. But I can go to UK, stay there in quarantine for two weeks, and then start my licensing for top fuel in Europe. And if the borders open up for 22 to start running a championship, I'll be licensed and ready to go. And, and that's exactly what we did. Movement you made. While this is more like a Rolls Royce where you just... Welcome back to the Skinny Ladies and Gentlemen. Great to have you with us here in the Fatheads Eyewear Studio. We we're talking to Miss Ida Zetterstrom. Did winning, did having that success on the bike, did it help open the door for Top Fuel? I feel like it did, absolutely. So first of all, like from a social media and sponsor standpoint, I mean, racing the bikes, the good thing is we did everything ourselves, we built our own engines and like we ran our own program and we could share that with everybody and we built up a, a good following where I could kind of take everyone behind the scenes to show what we were doing with both the race teams and with sponsors and traveling and everything and doing that definitely helped me having something to stand on and, and to grow more into when we were coming into Top Fuel. So I felt like I had a lot of good sponsors uh, that wanted, when I talked to them and I said, hey, I uh, it, it's top fuel that I want to do, and that is the end goal. And they said, we don't care whatever you're on, as long as you're racing, we're with you. And, like, they wanted to be part of what we were building. Saying a lot. Yeah, and and, and that helped, you know, tremendously. I had, I had basically two sponsors that was hard to take over because it was a turbo manufacturer and a, <laughs> a blow-off wolves. Like, that was hard, of course, on the top fuel. But we even found a way to work together with them with our project project cars that we had on the outside where we were put in, we put an LS engine uh, with uh, twin turbos on in that and was able to, you know, still keep the relationships alive. So that helped a lot. But also, like, for myself as a driver, I think racing... Um, racing street bike helped me a lot more than I realized at the time. Like going into top fuel, I had all I had all like already made that transition into a class that was very hard to run uh, when I transitioned into super street bike. So like mentally, I was more prepared going into top fuel than I would have been earlier because. I had already been through the struggle, so people telling me there's no way you can do it, or you know this is, um, you know, just all, all of the hurdles, so to say, to get into something when you're a rookie and you're new at it and everybody watching you. But coming into Top Fuel and having done that already, I felt comfortable with having 30,000 people in the grandstand. I mean, when I licensed in Top Fuel, we had 40,000 people in the grandstand because we don't have any test sessions or rent a track to license. You have to do it 
in the thick of it when there's people everywhere and you have the live stream going and like there's there's no room for errors. But I had been in that situation before. And also riding the bike, they're really difficult to ride. Like they're hard to ride. And your reaction times, not just on the tree, but like your reaction times going down track, like how you process information about what the bike is doing, like taking in all the movements and taking in the sounds of the engine and like just what the bike wants to do and correct things um, as it happens. And that is going on in 215 miles per hour. That helped me getting into top field because they do the same thing. I mean, not the same thing like what's literally happening, but they will throw you curveballs and they will try to move around and they will, you know, drop a cylinder and you hear the sound sounding differently in the car. And like all of those things is things that you constantly have to look for and feel for in the car. And it's the same mindset as riding the bike. Like you constantly just have to take in what's happening and make split, de split decisions as you're going and you're doing it in a really quick pace. So we've got just a few minutes here before this segment's up. Run us, take us through a run in the out in the fuel car. In the fuel car. Well, I mean, the runoff, you obviously start when we start the car up. Yeah. Starting car up, you have your clutch fully in, you're holding that brake, and you're just waiting for, for a sign from your crew chief that you can go ahead, do your burnout, going through the burnout box. People have different routines here. Of course, you can, um, some people roll very quickly through it. Some people go very easy. I have a very quick burnout routine. So basically doing the burnout, it's, you know, step on the throttle, you have the throttle stop on. So if you watch it, it only moves about 5%, opening those right, plates about right. 5%. Yep. So you do your burnout. I have a really short burnout routine. After that, obviously, it gets the car to stop, um, putting it in reverse, waiting for my guy to they usually click the blades, like in case they're a little yeah, bit more push, them, down, push right. them a little bit, yeah. and show me to go in reverse. We do a backup routine, you know, getting into where they want me placed. Um, when they show me to start moving forward, I obviously I put it in forward, straightening the car up if needed, going in as close as possible, and they tell me, like, it's good to go. The guy that usually tells me into stage, he gives a little bang on my front tire, and then he walks away. And then you just sit there quietly for a little bit and waiting for for John basically to show me to go in. Usually I take this time, I look at the track and, you know, look at the tree. But new thing happening in NHRA is you're apparently looking at a big camera in your face. Just that, that's new to me. That We didn't have that in Europe. But right now you usually yeah, have the, a camera right in your face when you do this. Uh, I've, I've heard a few of the drivers are not fond of that. It's strange. Like I yeah. definitely had to like the first they time the boom off the side and yeah. they literally are sweep right in. And not just I mean, that, you have wild. the guys with the handheld cameras and yeah. they move up like right into your face. It's the only thing you see. So you kind of just have to block that out and just, you know, be in your mindset. And then when John shows me to go forward, you you go into stage, you know, you light that pre-stage bulb, you wait for the other person to to light it if they already haven't done it. And when you stage, you stage really shallow. That's a uh, good routine to always be you know the same all the time but as soon as you see that light go on you hit it like that's why we say go on yellow you don't go on green then you're too late so oh, yeah. you go on yellow but then going down the track obviously it's different some runs it's very simple where you just make really small movements uh, but some runs you do have to make more movements not big movements but you need to make more of them if you say like that um, and obviously, it depends on what's happening down track. If you're on a qualifying pass and you feel like you have a cylinder going out or you feel like it's starting to get loose, uh, you probably lift. But if you're in a race, you don't. Because obviously, if you can't see the other car, it's all game. And, and you drive through that, so you might have to use the steering wheel a little bit more. Um, and hopefully, you don't have to pedal it. But if you do, you will have to do that too. <laughs> but on a good pass, you shouldn't have to. And this is also things that like my routine in Europe were very similar. But the car itself was very different to drive. Like I had a I had a open cockpit in Europe. So that is different because the sound of the car is different. The whole feeling of the car is different with an open cockpit uh, compared to a closed canopy. Uh, but also like just the chassis are very different and like how they're set up. Like I was driving my car in Europe with a lot of force. Like I was, you didn't make big movements, but you put a lot of force into every movement you made. While this is more like a Rolls Royce where you just, doo -doo, you know, a little <laughs> like that. So you still need to make those movements. They're very critical, but you can't be doing them with the same amount of force. So, and all cars are set up differently. You know, it all comes down to chassis, how it's built, how the, um, how the guy running the car wants to have it set up, basically. And then a lot of it also, how the driver wants it. You usually make a good mix of both of them, so, if that makes sense. Awesome stuff. Great information. We'll be back with a little bit more in just a moment. 
it's good, he's taking his time. I get some more time to be ready for this. And all of a sudden I stamped that pedal and I left and I looked at the tree as I left and thought, it's not green yet, what the hell are you doing? The Skinny is brought to you by Fatheads Eyewear. Fatheads Eyewear, hardcore since 04. And American Coach, innovation is our life force. There's a nice wide shot here of the <laughs> Fatheads Eyewear studio. Ken Stout, Rico Elmore, and we have Miss Edith Zetterstrom on the set with us as well. Let's talk about the rest of the year here. You're finally back inside of the car. You made your debut up in uh, up at Brainerd, made it to the semifinals. Congratulations. Obviously, the U.S. Nationals here recently, and, and the rest of the year you'll be in the car. So talk to us about the plans. Oh, yeah. So we're, I mean... We're obviously not in the championship hunt this year with us on, only running these eight races, uh, but it gives us a great opportunity to find momentum for next year. That's all. That's what we're doing. Like we want to get into this feeling that you know we're, we're confident going in and chasing a championship next year. I mean that's that's what it's all about. So we obviously had a good start uh, running both in Brainerd and in Indy. Uh, we even got to run the Mission Foods Too Fast Too Tasty challenge in Indy, which was very cool because it was the last one of the year. We made it to the finals and. Um, it feels really good in the car, but it's also very exciting knowing that there's more potential to take out of it. It's more potential from me and from, you know, us as a team. So, so not driving a negative, but so everybody at home knows, explain to them your, your bad reaction time. My, uh, my red light. Yeah. Yeah. So basically when we were running in Brainerd. I should have said red lights. <laughs> I, I get it. No, but, uh, when we were running in Brainerd, I, I had. Good reaction times all through qualifying. I felt very confident in it. We won first round on a whole shot. And obviously a whole shot is when you leave first and that's why you win it. Like he had a better ET than I did, but we, we got him on that. And we were qualified 14th and we raced number one qualifier Steve Torrance in the first round. So it was a big round matchup and we got that win, felt good. Uh, second round, I had a 48 light, which in a top fuel is very good. Very like good. I felt, I felt yeah, very, very confident with my yeah. reaction times. Coming into semifinals against Sean Langdon, I didn't feel any nerves. It was the strangest thing. I wasn't nervous at all because I felt somehow that we have nothing to lose. We are in the semifinals. We're here to just prove ourselves. You know, we don't we don't feel like, yeah, we, we're just here. It felt felt really good. I was confident about it. Sat there, waited for Sean to get into stage, and looking at that tree, and I remember feeling in my head that. Um, it's good, he's taking his time. I get some more time to be ready for this. And all of a sudden I stamped that pedal and I left and I looked at the tree as I left and thought, it's not green yet, what the hell are you doing? And it's the strangest thing, it's never happened to me in my life. I know, but, I know that too. And that's why I wanted to ask yeah. it because you're like, I don't know, I don't have, yeah, you know. And, and like, I literally looked at the tree when I drove past and I was like, what did you do? It hasn't come on. And I was happy though that I changed it around quickly and thought, just drive for data. We don't have a lot of passes on this car. We need the data yeah, for it. Sure. So I, I I did a full pass. We made a great run. And I thought if John wants me to shut off, he'll click me off. Like, yeah, I'm going right. to run this yeah. to the end um, as long as the car is running well. And then it did. So, like, that was good out of that standpoint. But I got to the top end and I was just, like, baffled. I was like, what was that? I've never had that happen in my life. I walked up to Sean, I remember, and I, I asked him. I was like, like, what? I don't know what that was. And he just laughed and said, it happens. Like, we've all done it. But now I understand when people say that, like, my foot left and my brain didn't tell brain it. Brain is not connected to the phone. And you're right. And there's not it's a professional level drag racer that has not done it at it's, one it's time or so another. Strange. It's the craziest thing. And for some reason, I've heard this. I know that people talked about it in podcasts afterwards and so on. That Brainerd is a place where that apparently happens a lot. Nobody warned me about that before going in. But apparently there's it's a lot of things. There's a lot of people's brains that aren't connected at Brainerd. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you just out of the zoo. But for different I've, been, reasons. I've been a part of it. I know the whole program. Here's yeah. the kicker. Was the run good enough to beat him? We don't know. Because when I left, he left too. He and I think step. he doubled yeah. stepped. Oh, okay. yeah. So it's like, we, we will never know. But it was a good well, run. That's a good thing. So It's a good thing that you'll never know. <laughs> and, and, real, and real quick, and we got to wrap it, but real quick, talk to us about your sponsors. Yeah, so obviously... 
on this car this year, we have BP Racing, which is great. I've worked with BP Racing for several years, but never actually had a, a partnership like this in place. So I was very happy that we were able to make this happen for coming over here in the US. Yeah, and, and obviously, we this was something that we were working for going into Europe. So we were going to announce this for the European market. And I said, put a halt on that. Like, we're, we're trying to run in US. So I'm so happy we were able to do this over here. And obviously, I have Ed, Edelbrock and Comcams, which has been with me when I won the championship over in Europe. And we have... When we work with our project cars and so on, we we use a lot of Edinburgh and Comcam product, products and obviously Comcams for uh, for the top fuel car over here. So that has been very great. But then, of course, we have uh, Leatherwood that is both on my and Tony's car. Dodge, I've had a really tight partnership with Dodge for several years. And we were just in, in Europe shooting the next episode of In and Out and they're, they're serious. Um, and then, of course, we have like what Michael Waltrip is on the car. We have several... Um, smaller sponsors too that are there supporting us and helping out but overall jcm has a great group of companies around them that are making this happen you got an amazing car owner Uh, and kath and kathy was even better than joe and i hope joe (laughs) sees this but they're great people yeah no i'm very happy what a great story we we certainly wish you you know all the best going forward here the rest of this year thanks for taking the time welcome to the states enjoy yourself take it all in and go win some races we'll be watching so much that's what we're gonna do yes and there you go that's the skinny on Eda. 